morning and welcome everyone. Um, the announcements are on the back of your uh, bulletin this morning. Just a couple of things to bring to your attention. Uh, next Sunday will be communion and the Ash Wednesday worship service is the 22nd at 3 p.m. here. Uh, there's a winter serenade concert with Christina and Adrian here on the 25th um, at 2 o'clock. So if everybody could come out and support them, that would be wonderful. Um, our annual congregational meeting starts at 10 o'clock on the 26th. Um, and then our meeting will take place at 11.15 after we have coffee and some goodies. The rest of them I will let you read on your own. There is one sad note that I must mention this morning. Uh, Hugh Wright has passed away and we send our condolences to the Wright family. Um, anybody else have anything they want to pass along? Can I say something quickly? Sure, Anne, go ahead. I just wanted to highlight that next week for the communion, um, the service will begin with a hymn sing. So that means you have a whole week to figure out what your favorite hymn might be that you could uh, put forth, and we'll sing it with gusto. So think about that. <laughs> Reverend Deb. Thank you. You could have chosen comfort, the warmth of your bed and a hot cup of coffee. You could have chosen solitude, silence or self-pity. You could have chosen doubt, shame or destruction. Let us pray. God of time, of seasons, of choices, of our lives. You give us the seasons in nature, in the church year, seasons of stretching and growing, of changing and becoming. Order and reorder our lives for your plans patterns and purposes. When destruction, denial, and death seem to press in all around us, redirect us to the abundant life found in Christ. It is in his name that we pray. Amen. Our hymn is hymn 209, O Love That Wilt Not Let Me Go, in 209.
questions about it, but th this is probably the last Sunday you're going to see it for a little while. Um, as we're about to discuss. Um, so this school is the church year. Um, and if I were to say where we are in the church year on it, we are right here um, on this block. Um, next week we get into Transfiguration and then Ash Wednesday and then Lent. Um, and then we're having green for a while until back up over here in June. Um, but, and green represents ordinary time in the church year. That's what we call the green seasons. Um, but I think that green is the season we live most of our lives in. Um, and so green, to me, and I've heard other people call it this, that green is the growing time. Um, that that's a way of thinking about uh, the green season in our church year. And so I wanted to um, highlight that and, and think about that um, as, we, as we talk about time, as we talk about life, as we talk about the seasons in our lives. And um, thinking about um, the ways that maybe the church calendar gives us another way of thinking about some of the time and seasons in our lives and times and seasons in the year. So I wanted to bring that forward to you today. I know some people have noticed it and asked questions about it. And so I wanted to highlight that, um, particularly as we stand on the break between a few seasons. So, um, anyways, that's, uh, that's our lesson for today. <laughs> Our responsive psalm for this morning is Psalm 119, um, verses 1 to 8, and we'll be singing refrain 1. Diligently. Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes, that I shall not be put to shame, having my eyes fixed on all your commandments. I will praise you with an upright heart when I learn your righteous ordinances. I will observe your statutes. Do not utterly forsake me.
Our scripture reading this morning uh, come from Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 15 to 20. See, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. For I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, and to keep his commands, decrees, and laws. Then you will live and increase, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away and you are not obedient, and if you are drawn away to bow down to other gods and worship them, I declare to you this day you will certainly be destroyed. You will not live long in the land you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. This day I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live. And as you, and, and that you may love the Lord your God, listen to his voice and hold fast to him. For the Lord is your life, and he will give you many years in the land he swore to give to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Our second reading comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 to 9. Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you are not ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly, for since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere human beings? What, after all, is Apollos, and what is Paul? Only servants, through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor. For we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. The word of the Lord. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts together be found holy and acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. The truth about stories is that that's all we are, stated Thomas King in his CBC Massey lecture series. Stories matter. Our stories matter. Perhaps the stories that matter most are the ones we hold about ourselves and the ones we believe about God. Part of my previous ministry with street-involved youth and individuals involved in the sex trade, these narratives would often present themselves in various ways sometimes helpful, sometimes not. There were two questions that would often present themselves in that work. They're not exclusive to that. They are important questions and questions that continue to fascinate me. The questions are these. How do you imagine God perceives you? And the second question, how do you understand yourself as the hero or agent in your own story? Put another way, how do you understand your sense of self, choice, and agency? Perhaps you want to take some time for yourself to reflect on these questions. Truth be told, 
My closest relationships are the ones where we vulnerably struggle together with these two questions. Where there's an invitation to help name, claim, and tell our stories in more wholehearted ways. It's like, you know when your favorite TV show brings in a new writer or introduces a storyline that has you scratching your head? There are now blaring inconsistencies or the character you fell in love with is suddenly doing something that seems so out of character. The Rachel Joey romantic storyline on Friends, or the office after Michael left and Andy got weirder, or the entire seventh season of Gilmore Girls. <laughs> A good friend calls out the inconsistencies and destructive narratives, the shame-based ones, the one I sometimes call my gremlin-y one. They might say things like, that's not how I see you, or I'm not sure I see evidence to support that story. And in so doing, it redirects us to seeing ourselves, the people around us, and God in more life-giving and wholehearted ways. These five verses in Deuteronomy create a lens through which those two questions get answered, not only in Deuteronomy itself, but in various ways throughout the Hebrew scriptures. The Deuteronomistic historian, the editor or redactor of large parts of the Old Testament, measures whether the kings, leaders, and people themselves are good or bl bad, blessed or cursed, by how their actions reflect choosing life and obeying God's commands. Our lectionary text from Deuteronomy this week is concerned with the questions of what makes life possible, individually and together as a community. Let's remember the context. The people of Israel had been led out of enslavement in Egypt. They had been fed with manna in the desert and water had sprung forth from rocks to quench their thirst. God had given them the law and created covenant with them. They had been wandering for some time and now their wandering in the wilderness is about to come to an end. And so too is Moses' leadership of them. Moses summons all the people together and they are given a series of blessings and curses, instructions on how to live together into the future in the promised land that God is about to lead them into. They can choose to keep God's commandments and walk in God's way which will lead to abundant living and communal flourishing, or they can turn away, which will lead to death and destruction. In many ways, Moses is reminding them of what they already know to be true, because this is the story that they have lived and experienced together in the wilderness. Choosing life for yourself while not alleviating the oppression of others or the peril of planetary living misses the point of this passage. And that is what our prophetic text the last few weeks have reminded us of. This text is not telling us that when people are suffering or being oppressed, we get to sit back and say, well, they must have chosen. However, throughout history, God's people have missed that point, and judges, prophets, and Jesus have needed to set the record straight again and again in Scripture, again and again throughout human history. The command to choose life is to work for what makes life possible, not just for oneself and one's immediate circle of concern, but for the community as a whole. In the context of moving from a nomadic people who were constantly having to work together to a settled, landed people 
This is an important message. <coughs> Moses reminds them, don't forget to work for the life of the whole community, or peril will befall you. Don't forget to think about your decisions and how they will impact future generations. Remember this covenant. Remember the covenant God has made with us. Teach it to your children. This text asks us to consider the choices we make in numerous ways on a daily basis. Are we choosing life and not death? How do our choices impact others? Not only our descendants, but also the people around us. Life on this planet. How do our choices bear witness to abundant life? To the glory of God in every creature, fully alive. It's hard to make those choices. If the stories we tell about ourselves and about God are not life-affirming, if we believe ourselves to be bad rather than beloved, if we believe God's actions towards us to be punishment rather than protection, and God's feelings towards us to be loathing rather than loving. It's hard to get to living when you're stuck in a story of destruction. Better Get to Living, the title of today's sermon, is borrowed from a Dolly Parton song. She says about this song, I think life has always been a pressure cooker. People react to whatever pressures they're under at the time according to their tolerance level and their mental attitude. Certainly, with so much attention today on being skinny and beautiful, rich and famous, equal pay for equal work, getting ahead, raising kids, holding down a job, getting older, etc. Well, I think this song says some things to let people know they're not the only ones in that fix. And this song offers some advice for a way out. Some of the advice she gives in this song is you better get to living. Giving. Don't forget to throw in a little forgiving and loving along the way. You better get to knowing, showing, a little bit more concern about where you're going. Just a word unto the wise. You better get to living. She continues throughout the song talking about giving and forgiving, praying, sharing, caring, as part of what it means to get to living, to choosing life. Choosing life is different than denying death. Our culture is quite good at denying death with lotions, potions, dyes, diets, and serums that promise to make you look younger and live longer. Death gets sanitized. We don't want to see it, to hear it, to think about it, to talk about it. But that doesn't mean our culture is life giving or life affirming. The constant grind, toxic corporate workplaces, and destruction of biodiverse ecosystems for development is not choosing affirming or sustaining life. High burnout rates and an inability to rest is not choosing life. And I think that these are important things for us to think about and ponder as we approach Ash Wednesday and Lent. Marking ourselves with ashes and naming that we are dust and to dust we will return is most definitely not death denying. To me, Ash Wednesday is life affirming in the most countercultural and beautiful of ways. It is life affirming in the way that puts things back in its proper place, that acts as a reset, in the ways that it names that God is God and I am not. Ash Wednesday and the season of Lent ground us in our humanness and in our reliance on God. 
Lent is not about giving up chocolate. It's about making a conscious choice to see our lives, ourselves, and God more clearly. That is choosing the abundant life God offers us in Christ. And so, dear ones, let's get to living together in the light of God's love. To God be all the glory. Amen. God sets choices before us. Some can bring life and blessing, but others lead to despair. When we give our gifts to God, we make a choice for life, a choice to bless others in God's holy name. So trust that God will bless the choice we make today. Gracious and generous God, we bring our gifts to you in thanksgiving. Bless them and surprise us by all the Holy Spirit can accomplish with them. Bless our lives too, so that our choices will always honor you. For Christ's sake. God, him free eight. God of life 
and love, in spoken words, in sung melodies, and in the silence of our hearts. Our thanks and praise is given to you for all of life, for choice and agency, for blessing and belovedness, for the lives we actually have, for the self you actually love. Hear us as we pray your blessing on all of it, the good and the hard, the joy and the sorrow, the wholehearted and the need for healing. Hear us as we pray for the people of Syria and Turkey in the aftermath of the earthquake. Be with families grieving loved ones who are lost, who are dead, who are presumed to be. Be with the lost. Be with rescue workers. Be with relief workers. Be with the homeless, the hurting, and those clinging to hope. Hear us as our questions swirl about the bus that crashed into a daycare in Quebec this week. Hear our horror and our heartbreak for the families, for the children. Hear us as we pray for the places of conflict in our world and our fears of conflicts yet to come between Russia and Ukraine, between the United States and China, in Iran, in all the places of turmoil and unrest. Hear us as we pray for those close to us, those in our circle of care and concern, those in our church family. We pray for Gary and Kathleen Scott and their family. For the family of Hugh Wright, thinking particularly of Pam and their children. Be with them and surround them with your peace. Bless your church in this place. Bless your people that they may know their belovedness and to live abundantly to be a blessing in this world you so love. We pray in the name of the blessed and beloved one who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debts. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our hymn is hymn 410, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore You, hymn 410.
May the God of Sarah, Rahab, and Deborah bless you with faith, courage, and wisdom. May Jesus Christ, who is held in Mary's arms, hold you in his loving embrace. And may the Holy Spirit, who comes sailing on the wind, fill all your days with hope. Amen.